Hello and welcome to the first of these audiovisual presentations as part of the Social Psychology course. My name is Dr. Kahlo Shukru and in these audiovisual presentations I'm going to be covering content that I think is important in terms of understanding social psychology but for which there isn't time to cover it in the lectures or the seminars. The idea here is to sort of supplement the lectures, add a, a little bit more and um, it gives me a chance to cover topics that there wouldn't be time to cover otherwise but which I think are important because they link into the topics that I do cover in the lectures and the seminars. I'm hoping that people will listen to these audiovisual presentations in addition to attending the lectures. They're not intended to replace the lectures. I'll try to keep them short and to the point and as interesting as I can. I guess there's a, an advantage for the audiovisual presentation over the lecture for some of you in that you get more control over me. If I'm rambling on, as I'm kind of doing at the moment slightly, you can skip ahead to the, the bits you're interested in. I do recommend, though, that rather than jumping about in the recordings, you listen to them all the way through at least once, so you can get a sense of the area I'm talking about. And then, if there's particular things you're interested in, you can then jump back and listen to those bits again. In this first presentation, I'm going to be talking about an area of group dynamics that relates to how we function as a group when we're engaged in a task. So often we work together with groups to achieve certain tasks, and being part of a group in that way and engaged in a task affects how we behave. So let's start talking about that. Before we get into the, the nitty-gritty of how being part of a group, engaged in a task, affects the behaviour of those people in that group. I just wanted to recap on uh, one or two key ideas which we will have covered in the lecture, which are going to be relevant again here. So in the lecture we saw that the study of group dynamics and uh, social identity is built around the central idea that our behaviour as individuals is affected by the groups we belong to. So we all belong to several different groups in our social lives, family, friends, work, teams, anything else that we do. And belonging to these different groups has an effect on us, and it has an effect on us when we're with them, but it also has an effect on us when we're on our own, when nobody else is present. We are still affected by being in a group, or various groups, even when we're on our own. And in order then to understand the behaviour of any individual, you need to also study the groups that the individual belongs to. Um, there are various things about the group that can affect the behaviour of the individual. The characteristics of the group can affect the individual. So you can see examples of some of those characteristics here on the left. Uh, how interdependent the members of the group are, how much the, they affect each other, and how the successes and failures of one person affects the other people in the group. That can affect us very heavily. But also our roles within different groups can affect us. Uh, what is uh, expected of us by that group can affect our behaviour all the time. So if you're expected to be the reliable one in your group, it can affect how you behave, even when the group isn't present. Uh, also, the norms of the group can affect us, what are considered to be the rules of the group, sometimes written, sometimes unwritten, can have a very powerful shaping effect on our behaviour. Again, whether or not the other members of the group are present, we can still find ourselves following the norms of that group all the time. And since there are several groups and they sometimes have different norms, this can cause us some difficulties in trying to balance out the different expectations that different groups have of us. Now you'll see these concepts crop up again here in this session, how the characteristics of a group can affect how that group behaves, and also how the norms or our role within a group can affect how we behave on a task when that group is involved. Let's move on now to look at the specifics of what we're going to cover in this session. Now I've mentioned a few times now that this session is looking at how there are differences between groups and individuals when working on tasks, but I haven't really explained what I mean by a task. A task is a fairly broad term. Uh, it can describe anything from making yourself a cup of tea to curing cancer. It's, it's a very broad and vague term. Uh, and in that large range of things which qualify as tasks, you can see that some tasks are very much suited to being done by individuals on their own, and other tasks 
you just wouldn't even think of trying them except as part of a group. Now, moving away from the extremes of things that are clearly suited to one person or clearly suited to a group, there are a lot of tasks in the middle which could be done by individuals or could be done by groups. So for example, moving house. That's something I probably could do on my own, but it would be a huge amount of work. And so it's probably better if I did it as part of a group. I ask my friends to help or I hire professional movers. However, when considering whether or not to do something on your own or as part of a group, you need to consider what are the pros and cons. What are the advantages of working as a group on a task and what are the advantages of working that task on your own? The advantages of working in a group, some of them are pretty obvious. So for really big jobs, which would be either impossible to do on our own or just a huge amount of work for one person to do, as a group we get to divide it up. And this means that each person has a manageable amount of work to do. But it also means that all the different people working together as a group on the task, they each get to bring something different. We get to pool our resources. Everybody brings their different skills, everybody has their a certain amount of time they can devote to it. Everybody some people might have equipment they bring as part of their contribution to the group and so all of these resources and skills and knowledge make the group more effective than one person would have been on their own. And the other advantage of being able to break the task up into bits and giving each person in the group a different bit to do is that it allows for specialization. So in most large organizations they take a very big or complex task and they break it down and then they give different people the same part of that task to do over and over again, allowing that person to become extremely specialised and very highly skilled at that one part of the task. So if you imagine, say, making a, a movie, there's lots of different roles, lighting, camera work, script, acting, directing. By giving people one specific task over and over again, so this person is always the director, these people always work in lighting, they get to get very good at that, way better than any one individual could get if they had to do it all. And this high level of specialisation is a feature we see in groups over and over again and allows groups to become more effective because people get to really practice that one area and become expert in it. However, it's not all good. Um, there are some things about groups which can make them less effective and we know about those too. So, for example, if the group doesn't get on, if there's a lot of bickering or if people aren't talking to each other, low cohesiveness is how psychology would describe that, and yeah, it can make the group less effective. Um, also, if uh, there are people who aren't pulling their weight, if there are certain people in the group who kind of are just along for the ride, let everybody else do the work, this can make uh, the group less effective. And if there are a lot of these people, it can sometimes mean that you're carrying their weight, in effect, making your job harder than it would be just to, to do the job on your own. This is known as social loafing and we'll look at that in a little bit more detail later on. Lastly, we need to consider how sometimes the habits and the norms of the group, the way the group has always behaved, its, it's kind of normal mode of operation, this can sometimes get in the way, especially if things aren't working out well and the group needs to change how it behaves. Reluctance in groups to change can cause a problem and uh, this can really happen in very cohesive groups where the group is very tight-knit and everybody is getting on very well. Sometimes the habits of the group then can become very ritualistic and the group won't change even when it should and this is groupthink and we'll look at that in a little bit more detail as well. What I'm trying to do here when I'm highlighting the pros and cons of group work is to show that um, it's not always clear-cut if working in a group is going to be an advantage or not. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. And what that teaches us is that in order to be an effective leader of a group or just an effective person working in a group, we need to know about these benefits and disadvantages. We need to know when the benefits occur so we can make the most of them and use groups in that situation. But we also need to know when the what the disadvantages are so we can avoid them and make uh, either avoid using a group in situations where it doesn't suit or to get the most out of a group by minimizing the negative or even avoiding the negative if we can. 
So let's look at some of these negative qualities that happen when people work in groups and see how we can deal with them. I'm going to start off by talking about social loafing. Social loafing describes a scenario that we're all familiar with where people work less hard in a group than they would do if they were working on the same task as individuals. So there are extreme cases of this where some people hardly do any work at all and let other people almost carry them, metaphorically speaking, as part of the group. But the truth is that it's not always so visible how people's productivity will drop when working in a group compared to working on their own. I mean, the original studies by Ingham et al. showed that in a tug-of-war team that even if people were pulling hard on the rope and trying to win and by no means slacking off or trying to let other people do the job for them, they were still pulling less hard when they were in the group than they would have if they were the only person pulling that rope. So I guess we, we just assume that we don't have to work as hard, maybe, when we're in a group as we do when we're on our own. Now, this means that the overall productivity of the group is always less than it should be because the people in the group, even the conscientious ones, might not be working as hard as they could or as they would if they were on their own. And I think it's also a mistake to think that everybody who isn't working as hard as they could, even the people who are dramatically working less hard than they could, it's a mistake to think that they're doing this intentionally or maliciously to sort of say, oh, well, you know, this person is, is trying to sort of uh, let other people do all the hard work and they're just trying to slack off and be lazy. It's not always that simple. Often people find that they are it's harder for them to know how much they're contributing to the group because it's hard to know which bit is their contribution and which bit is the contribution of the other people. And so it's, it's harder to judge how much of a difference you're making when you're part of a group than it would be if you were on your own. Um, and also, sometimes the problem is that people feel that they're just going to get less out of the result of the, the task if they're part of a group. So they feel less invested in it. Uh, you know, if I'm going to have to share the rewards, if I'm going to have to share the, the credit with lots of other people, it's less exciting, it's less motivating to me than uh, if I know that I'm going to get all of the rewards, all of the credit myself. That pushes me harder. It's, it's more attractive to me. I'm going to make me work a little bit harder if I know that I'm getting everything. That's sort of fairly basic human nature, even for people who are team players and helpful it's a little bit more motivating if we know we're going to get all the credit rather than just some of it. So what this tells us is that the solution to social loafing, which most people think, which is we should be policing people more, we should be checking what everybody's doing and cracking down on the lazy ones, that's missing the point slightly. This isn't about sort of punishing people who are trying to be uh, naughty or um, sort of unhelpful. This is about giving people the information they need, sometimes, to make the right judgment. So, for example, it's been found that you can decrease social loafing by making it easier for people to identify, even just for themselves, how much of a contribution they're making. So, again, it's not about making, not necessarily about making that information public and having other people police them. Even if just people themselves can know what they're con contributing, they're less likely to then sort of misjudge how much they can do and more likely to push themselves harder if they can see the benefits of that work in terms of their output. But that only happens if they can identify their own output and see how much they're contributing. Um, you can also improve or reduce social loafing by giving people more of an investment in the outcome. If they feel more connected with the outcome, if they feel if they care more about the result, they're less likely to loaf. And sometimes that's about helping people understand what the point is of the, the group task. In larger organisations, sometimes people can get lost. They, they can lose sight of what the group is trying to do or they won't really understand what the point is. But helping them see the benefits and getting them on board. Now, sometimes that means maybe sharing more of the profits or the, the credit with them. Or sometimes it's just about explaining more about what the group is about and what it's trying to achieve that will have this effect. Um, Generally speaking, 
people are less likely to loaf if they feel more connected to the people around them. The more cohesive the group is, um, the less likely people are to sort of slack off, um, and the more they're likely to push themselves to try and contribute as much as they can. So a lot of the things that the organizations do in terms of team building, you know, these corporate retreats or um, sort of, um, you know, kind of uh, sports leagues with different uh, departments in the same organization competing in the, in the sport, five-side football, whatever, these team building exercises are actually not a bad idea if you want to increase cohesiveness and by co increasing cohesiveness, cohesiveness you may reduce social loafing. So I think the important idea here is to get away from the idea that everybody who is loafing or not pushing themselves as hard is doing so because they're lazy. I think it's better to view this as um, people getting lost in, their, in the group and finding it harder to see what the point is of their contribution or what they're going to get out of it or why they should do it or you know, how, much, how connected they feel to the other people in the group. If you can tackle those issues, you can seriously reduce social loafing. Another way in which the behavior of a group engaged in a task can be problematic concerns the way that the group makes decisions. Now, all groups need to make decisions, and there are various ways that they can do this through um, sort of voting or the leader making the decisions or a combination of both. But there's a particular kind of decision making which groups can fall foul to which can lead the group to make disastrously wrong decisions often ignoring dangers which are fairly obvious and apparent to everybody outside the group of which for some reason the members of the group can't see and this phenomenon it doesn't happen that often but when it does it can have a really disastrous impact on the group's performance on a task because the group can end up making a decision which when looked back on was quite clearly the wrong thing to do, but which the group at the time felt was the only choice that made sense to them. This phenomenon is called groupthink, and it is caused by something which is somewhat unexpected. It can be caused by extremely high levels of cohesiveness. Now, I've mentioned cohesiveness earlier, and generally when I mention it, it's presented as a good thing. The more tight-knit a group is, the more the people in the group get along, the more they feel connected to each other, the more that each person in the group values the group and wants to belong to it. These are all elements of cohesiveness, and they sound positive, and they usually are positive. So, for example, as I've said before, in cases of social loafing, the more cohesive the group is, the less p each person in the group is likely to be loafing or pushing themselves less hard than they could be. So, like I said, cohesiveness is typically presented as a good thing. So how on earth can cohesiveness be the, the culprit for groupthink? Janus and others have studied groupthink by studying disasters, studying occasions when groups have made a really disastrously bad decision or series of decisions. And what they found is that in these groups a certain set of characteristics emerge which seem to almost funnel the group towards a disastrous decision. They're almost pushing the group in that direction without anybody in the group realizing it. Um, now typically the, the group tends to be already pretty tight-knit, cohesive, but the effect of that seems to be that it isolates the group a bit from outside information and influences, that the group becomes almost turned inwards, more only really concerned with what people in the group think, not really listening to people outside of the group. And this can happen in very tight-knit groups where they, they become introverted and really only interested in the opinions of the other members of the group, not really caring what the rest of the world thinks. Now, in these situations, if the group starts heading towards a bad decision, a lot of the, the sort of breaks, a lot of the, the natural processes which would then normally prevent the group from making an obviously bad, wrong decision don't happen with these very cohesive groups. 
So in most normal groups, when somebody suggests a really disastrous idea, somebody in the group will usually say, hold on a minute, that's a, isn't that a really bad idea? And here's why. They'll, they'll be dissenters, people who disagree. But in very cohesive groups, often people don't want to be the person who's complaining or disagreeing. They, they, they're so concerned with being part of the group and everybody getting along that they, they self-censor. They say to themselves, well, everybody else seems to be okay with this idea. You know, they, uh, they must know something I don't. Uh, and because there may be people outside of the group who are saying, hold on a minute, this is a disastrous idea. Don't do that. Can't you see this is going to go horribly wrong? The group doesn't hear these voices because, again, they're, they're sort of introverted. They're only listening to each other. They're ignoring the warning signs and the, the, the warnings coming from outside from other people. It can even go further in the sense that some people in the group, a very cohesive group, can take it on themselves to put people off dissenting, put people off disagreeing. They'll, they'll often do this under the misguided intention to try and you know, help smooth things over, help everybody get along, you know, avoid uh, disagreements and arguments. But what they actually do is they sort of cause people to not speak out when they would otherwise speak up and say, I think this is a bad idea. Uh, and when people outside the group sometimes try to um, sort of, if you like, warn them, the, these sort of self-appointed guardians of the group will find ways to dismiss these, these outside people and, and explain why these people couldn't possibly understand what the group understands. They'll dismiss them or they'll stereotype them or in some way diminish them so that the group doesn't have to worry about these people pointing out a disaster which they can see but the group seems to be blind to. Now, the, the people who study this have studied it in pretty dramatic examples. So, for example, um, the Challenger space shuttle, which was the only space shuttle to uh, explode and killed all the astronauts on board. There were some, looking back afterwards, there were some very obvious signs that things were going wrong before the shuttle was launched. And things that the people in NASA who were running launch should have seen but didn't because uh, of groupthink, because they uh, were falling foul to all of the, the forces I've just described. Um, another example uh, that people people sometimes use is the, the um, unpreparedness of uh, the American leadership before Pearl Harbor, that there were plenty of signs and warnings to the generals and admirals in Pearl Harbor that something bad was about to happen. But again, through a process of groupthink, they ignored the warnings and the disaster happened. Now, you don't have to go for something as major as a rocket exploding or a, an enemy invading your country to, to find examples of groupthink. There are less dramatic examples of groupthink uh, in everyday organizations. And it's something we need to watch out for when an organization is a place where disagreement is discouraged, where people who um, speak out against a, a policy or a practice or way of doing things are hushed or ignored, then there's a danger that that policy and practice could be dangerous or very ineffective and it's not being seen by the people who are engaged in the practice and policy every day because of groupthink. And this can happen in organizations all the time where we continue with ineffective practices for years and years because nobody wants to be the one to rock the boat. This happens in education, it happens anywhere. And groupthink, or a, a sort of a, a version of groupthink operating in that team, in that organization, can be to blame. So how can we avoid this? What can we do in an educational situation or elsewhere to minimize groupthink, to ensure that we don't fall foul to it. Well, um, since people often don't want to be the one to rock the boat and don't want to be sort of seen to be disagree, giving people an anonymous way to provide feedback or suggestions helps get around that because then people don't worry about being seen as being the difficult one or the one who always raises issues. 
Um, often educational organizations and institutions have a system of inviting external review and critiques. So critical friend exercises or uh, external examiners or even um, professional bodies like uh, Ofsted, not often seen as a good thing, but um, in the case of groupthink, a very necessary thing because they come in from the outside and they, they shake things up and they give uh, a view which can often challenge the internal view and, and break up habits which become too automatic, too ritualistic. And so this is generally a good thing. Lastly, uh, another way to tackle this is that often groupthink is most dramatic when all decisions and discussions happen in one big group because then there's no room for disagreement everybody else is watching you as you speak and uh, everybody feels the pressure to sort of agree with the group however if you break that bigger group up into smaller groups and allow them to discuss the issue separately often this produces a great variety a bigger variety of opinion and as a result it then it's more likely when you bring those small groups back together that you'll hear the dissenting voices, you'll hear the disagreeing voices, the people who point out the flaws more than if everybody was forced to just discuss it in one big group. So like I said, groupthink has been studied in very dramatic examples where it's led to major disasters, but it can happen in a much less dramatic way in the day-to-day -day by simply perpetuating bad practices or ineffective practices and nobody being willing to challenge them. And as such, it's an issue that all educational uh, groups and organisations need to be wary of. Up until now, I've tended to focus on the negatives, typically because the negatives, there's, there's more to discuss in terms of understanding why they are negative and also how we can get around them. Most of the positives, as I mentioned earlier, are fairly self-evident and don't need a, a lot of unpacking. But there is one particular positive to group work which is worthy of a bit more discussion because it's not a very obvious one. In fact, it's a positive that many people that aren't even aware exists. And it's best described by the concept of wisdom of crowds. Before I get into that, uh, it's best illustrated with an example. A lot of teachers really love to use classroom discussions. It's a very commonly used tool. I love to use them myself all the time. And this can be used either in the form of getting students to discuss an idea with you directly or to get it to discuss it amongst themselves first. Now, the reason why teachers use this technique so often isn't hard to understand. Many teachers believe that when students are discussing things in class as opposed to simply listening, like you are now, that they're more active learners and that they're getting more out of the experience. Not just that they're enjoying it more, but actually that they're learning more. And I think the other reason why s a lot of teachers love classroom discussion is, especially when they give students to discuss things amongst themselves, is that it widens participation. When you throw out questions to the class, it tends to be the same few students who talk and say something back. But if you give the class something to discuss amongst themselves, many more people get involved. And so it seems to spread the benefit of that active learning. However, despite the fact that teachers love it, students aren't always so sold on the idea. They have more reservations. Um, I think a lot, of that, a lot of those reservations are based in the, uh, the fact that most students are used to a more traditional didactic learning experience. They're used to a classroom where the teacher does all the talking and the student's job is to listen and write down the important notes. And so when thrown into a classroom where they're now expected to do a lot more of the talking, they're sceptical. It doesn't feel like learning that they're used to and the things that we're that we find unfamiliar, we often find are um, things we don't like. But I think another reason why a lot of students are sceptical of classes which are very heavy on discussion, especially discussion amongst the students, is that they feel that learning can't happen unless an expert is involved. They, they have a view, view of learning as going from knowing less to knowing more. And they feel that can only happen when someone who knows more than you do is involved in the discussion. So I can't learn from these other people in the class because they know as little as I do about the topic. It's the, the blind leading the blind. Now this is relevant to uh, what I'm about to talk about because it, it is based on a central assumption or a central question. Can a group of people achieve learning, achieve insight, gain new knowledge 
without someone who already has that knowledge being involved? Is it possible for a group of people who don't know the answer to find the right answer on their own, even if none of the people involved know the right answer for sure? It's an interesting question, and the answer to it could be found in this phenomenon, which I'm, talk I'm going to talk about in a second, wisdom of crowds. So what is the wisdom of crowds? Well, the wisdom of crowds is a phenomenon which has um, been demonstrated usually in situations where the question being asked has a definite correct answer and often it's most cleanly demonstrated in situations where the question is a numerical question and then what you do is you ask each person in the crowd to separately come up with an answer not letting them hear what anybody else is saying you bring together all those separate answers and then if they're numerical answers you can get a numerical average the mean and what has been found is that quite often the average answer from the crowd is very close to the correct answer. So it's showing that basically even though no person in the crowd was absolutely certain what the correct answer was, that collectively they found the right answer together. Um, and the people who studied this have found that it works best when you've got a nice varied crowd with lots of different sort of backgrounds and experiences that each person is giving their answer independently of each other um, that uh, each person is able to sort of bring together bring their own experiences and knowledge on board which is decentralization uh, but that somebody then is able to bring all the different answers together to find this kind of average now although it can be most clearly demonstrated, this phenomenon can be most clearly demonstrated with a numerical answer because it allows you to show that actually the, the collective answer of the crowd is correct because it's a definitely right answer and you can mathematically compare it to the answer the crowd comes up with. I think that's only important in terms of demonstrating this phenomenon in effectively proving that it, it happens. But I think exactly the same phenomenon is going to happen even when the question being discussed has got no definite right or wrong answer, where it's more ill-defined, the kind of questions we often face in education, where they're not numerical questions, where there's no clear right or wrong answer, I think you're still going to get the same phenomenon happening, the same wisdom of crowds happening there as well. It's just not so easy to prove that it's happened. But I think if we can prove it happens with the numerical answers, I think the same principle will carry across to the non-numerical, not clean-cut questions that we all face in education. I think there again it's possible for a group of people, a group of students to achieve wisdom, to achieve insight and find uh, a, a valid answer on their own in the same way that the crowd finds a valid answer to the numerical question. I think the students discussing things in groups in classrooms, working together on a task can come up with just as good an answer, just as good a solution they can achieve just as much insight as they would have achieved listening to the expert. And that is the central idea behind wisdom of crowds as far as I'm concerned. Wisdom of crowds demonstrates that people working together on a task can achieve a level of performance that is greater than any one of them would have achieved on their own. Not just in terms of being able to achieve more, but can actually do a better job. And this happens even if none of the people in the task are experts, that somehow the, the whole becomes greater than the sum of the parts. And so in education in task, where students are given the, the job of working together on, an, on their own on a task, discussing a question, working on a project, and where students are sometimes sceptical that they, as equally inexperienced, lowly students, could come up with a right answer that they need an expert to be involved. Wisdom of crowds challenges that, says no, actually inexperienced everyday students like yourselves can achieve wisdom on your own without the need for an expert to be involved. And so I think this is an important thing to, for us to know in education and it's an important thing we need to share with our students in order to give them confidence when they're asked to work in groups on tasks like that.
So moving from one extreme to the other here, we've just been talking about uh, group discussions in class and how they may be more effective than they appear to be. I want to now talk about another very widely used technique, brainstorming, and point out that actually it might be less effective than it appears to be. Now brainstorming, like group discussions, is a very popular technique used by educators and in business and elsewhere as a method of uh, a group for stimulating new ideas, for stimulating creativity. The basic idea or the basic technique of brainstorming is simple. You bring people together, you encourage them to come up with any ideas and bounce ideas off each other and the, uh, the, the belief is that through brainstorming the group will come up with a larger quantity of better ideas. And it's been in use for many, many years now, and there's no denying that brainstorming does work. The, the issue is that it may not work as effectively as it appears to work. The central question is this, and this is the same question that we've been considering since the start of this session. Would the brainstorming technique of generating new ideas as a group, would that generate more ideas, better ideas, than each of these people working separately, individually? And the answer is not what you think it is. We generally believe that uh, brainstorming produces more ideas than people working on their own. That's a fairly widespread belief among people who both use brainstorming and participate in it. It has what uh, Strobe called the illusion of effectivity. Uh, the best way I can describe that is that when we are judging how effective a brainstorming session is, we don't tend to make the right comparison. We tend to make a comparison between how many ideas the brainstorming session came up with to how many ideas we would have come up with on our own, just us. And of course the group produces more ideas, but the real comparison we should be making is asking, well, if each of the people participating in the brainstorming session, if each of those had worked individually, and then we simply added all of their ideas together at the end, with the people never really having met or discussed them, would that produce more ideas than the brainstorming session did? And the answer is yes, it would. Generally speaking, if each of the people involved in brainstorming had instead spent the time working on their ideas separately, had come together at the very idea end and simply added all their ideas together, yes, you would have some duplication, but overall it would produce a greater variety of ideas than the brainstorming session would. But we don't make that comparison. We always compare the brainstorming session to just us on our own. And that's what creates the impression the brainstorming session is more effective than it really is. So why are brainstorming sessions not as effective as the same number of people working individually? Well, there's a number of factors of group dynamics that, that cause the problem. Um, you have social loafing rearing its ugly head again. As we know, we tend to work less hard when we're contributing to a group effort than we would on our own. But there's also elements of um, the issues we saw with um, uh, the uh, groupthink, where we worry about what other people are going to think about our ideas, and we self-censor, and we hold back because we're afraid that people will think our ideas are stupid or a bad idea, or because it'll appear that our idea is criticising somebody else, so we have apprehension and this causes us to withhold ideas, hold back. Lastly, there's simply the problem of any group of people all having ideas, all wanting to speak at the same time, that you have to wait, you have to wait your turn. And so as a result, uh, time is wasted, or you could be generating new ideas, simply waiting to have your turn to share your idea. This is what production blocking is all about. Um, so the combination of these three factors, apprehension of what people would think of our ideas, people not working as hard because they're sort of uh, working in a group, and the time wasted and waiting on other people to, to sort of get your chance to speak, all result in brainstorming sessions being less effective than the same number of individuals working individually. Um, of course, there are number of ways you can evaluate the effectiveness of a brainstorming session and the sheer number of ideas is not the only way. The quality of the ideas, how well developed they become, are other aspects that we should evaluate. And it's certainly the case that the 
brainstorming session might be more effective on those fronts, producing better developed ideas because people have had a chance to sort of talk them through and see how they work and find the flaws. Or maybe better quality ideas by being able to refine ideas, adding people's ideas together. But in order to really then have the best of both worlds, we need to have an individual period where each person is working on their own coming up with ideas and then only after they've done that bringing them together in a brainstorming session where all the different ideas are evaluated and combined or eliminated until you refine it down to the best ideas would seem to have the best of both worlds. So um, a number of ways have been suggested to do this. People may be contributing in originally, initially electronically submitting ideas so they could be submitted anonymously. Nobody has to worry about anybody judging their ideas a good one or a bad one. Um, also being electronic you don't have to wait on the other person to say their bit you can all be submitting at the same time but that initially it's a separate process and then only towards the end do you bring people together for the what we would call the proper brainstorming session to, to make the most of it so again I'm not here to trash brainstorming as a technique just to point out that maybe it's not we're not using it as effectively as we could be okay so it's time to just pull it all together here at the end and recap um, as you hopefully have seen in this audio-visual presentation. Um, group work is a, a perfect example of the way in which group membership can affect our behaviour both in positive ways and in negative ways. Um, and the, the use of group work in education and elsewhere is something I would still say the research very much encourages. Groups bring undeniable benefits. Certain projects are only possible if we engage with them as groups and benefit from all that specialization and division of labor and pooled resources that that really are the reason that many of us get into groups in the first place to kind of take advantage of those things but and this is important we need to be realistic about what groups are good at and we need to be realistic about what their flaws are so i've tried to show you that some of the things that we are already aware of in terms of limitations of groups like social loafing they may not work for the reasons or they may, these problems may not happen for the reasons we think they do and a better understanding of why the problem occurs will give us a method of tackling it. Other problems which we're less familiar with, dangers of uh, for example groupthink or the limitations of brainstorming represent sort of unexpected uh, perils, unexpected limitations that we need to be aware of and need to take into account so that they don't blindside us. Uh, brainstorming um, it being less effective than we think it is and groupthink being something that can happen without us being even aware of it. And lastly, we need to consider that there may be elements of group work which are unpopular or not necessarily popular with the students such as uh, you know, group discussions or working on projects which might be actually more effective than they appear to be if we understood them better. And so we have sort of wisdom of crowds there giving us insights into elements of group decision making and group uh, functioning which we might not uh, be aware of on the surface. All of this shows that uh, group work is a complex phenomenon in education and that since it's a very popular technique used by many educators, it's something we really need to understand better if we're going to use it effectively. I hope you've enjoyed this uh, presentation and thank you very much for your time.